Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. Where there are Sasquatch sightings, that's where we're gonna go. With so many chilling encounters, just waiting to be retold. So join us here in the spooky woods for the Duke Chat Show. with the Ohio grass man. No wait. That's that's <laughs> William Lunsford. We're back. That's it. <laughs> Glad that to be here with everybody again, uh, man. Almost a year ago at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference, the last time I got to see William. And and he does have a cameo in the upcoming Inevitably Finding Bigfoot, that's which it. will be shown in the premiere and the, on the big screen at the upcoming Nebraska Bigfoot Conference. Hey, come here. You want to see some big foot? That is one massive foot. When is that you may ask duke when is it and duke will say it is april 26th and 27th in grand island nebraska and get your tickets now show up it's going to be awesome two days of amazingness lots of great uh people that are going to be on there including uh by the time you see this last week's guest blaine tyler who was there previously but he only got to jump in for half an hour because another guest didn't make it and he was there as our pinch hitter, just in case. And it's a good thing we brought him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had a wealth of information. Even being unprepared, it's going to be even better this year. Yeah, he had like what less than a day to put some kind of presentation together for half an hour via remote. He wasn't even at home, you know? yeah. and it was still great. I mean, yeah. how, how much do you love the part where he's doing his Bigfoot girlfriend, and he's going, "Oh, oh here's the part where I make a call," Whoop. and then she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're gonna see some. They're gonna see quite a few good pictures from him, man. And like I said, he knows how to present it. He knows exactly where it was, what had happened, and the whole situation. So it's gonna be really. If for anybody that has any doubt about Bigfoot existence, they won't have any doubt once they leave the Nebraska conference this year. And there's our buddy right there. <laughs> She's the adventure dragon. William's been out Bigfooting with him before too. Yeah, I guess. So she decided he wants to come to the Nebraska Bigfoot conference with me this year. So he's gonna be there. Good deal. Say hi, Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> he already knows Keith Crabtree too. 
Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, Keith's a good guy, man. Keith's, and, and everybody's going to love meeting Keith Crabtree too, if they haven't already. Like I said, Keith is one of my research partners. He's one of the finest individuals you've ever met. He's honest, he's straightforward, and he'll just tell you the way it is. He's not going to lie for anybody, but he's not going to say anything either that hurts your feelings intentionally. He's just the kind of guy that's really good for this for this genre that we represent here. We're doing right now. So plus, he's the guy that wrote, wore the uh, Bigfoot suit in the Legend of Boggy Creek. Exactly. He uh, Keith is just, and he can tell you more about the background of that story, uh, being there in Falk. He did more, and like I said, he was the driver there when you see the car going down the road and things like that. So much of it that he did that he volunteered to, you know, and Keith was a young man. And I've walked some of them same hills when he's walking up that riverbank. I've done that myself, the very same place, the same riverbank. And buddy, for him to go up there at his size like that, he breezed up there like he was a cross country skier, man. So he's, he's a real good guy. You're going to enjoy meeting him. He's gonna. He always, uh, whenever he comes, he always brings some some cool swag with him too, man. He's got some things that you're gonna be proud to, to wear. And he is would, not. Uh, he's not on the speaking list this year, but he is going to be there with his little yeah. swag store. Yep. And so you'll have plenty of time to talk to him and ask him yep. about all the cool background stuff. Yep. And and William is absolutely right. I mean, he was like running the fog machine for all the scenes where they had fog in, which is practically every scene. Yeah, and he was right. doing the car stunts. And they had another scene where there's three guys walking down the road. He was the tall one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so he was all over the place. I think he was involved in the filming of every scene in that movie, even though he wasn't personally in every scene. He was involved in the filming of it. So he knows everything there is to know about that movie. And don't forget, that movie is all about, well, the folk monster. And yep. most of the sightings that are recounted in that movie happened on Crabtree land. That's exactly right. Yeah. He knew all about this stuff way before there was any movie. He grew up with it. He knew all about it. it His uncle Smokey did a whole lot also to uh, bring the notoriety to the creature in that area down there. But he did the same thing as Keith. Very honest man. He was very, very upset with the way some things went through there because the people some of the people didn't treat the people from foul fairly and i'm telling you they're good people i've had nothing to say but good things about them i delivered to them as a ups man i uh, i go down there you know at least once a week you know and visit things like that. just really really good old down to earth people and they the way they were portrayed in some of these ways was really unfair to them because man like i said i've never uh, they're just good old folk. That's the only way you say it. it's, it's folk from Falk, you know, and that's what they are. They, uh, they always had, uh, man, that there was never a day went by that I wasn't offered, you know, something to drink, something to eat while I was down there delivering to them. You know, I had five or 10 minutes to sit there and share a story, you know, and during my break time there, really, really enjoyable people. And the things that they knew once they finally opened up to me, oh man, you know, it's, it was just, they all know somebody or they all have somebody in their family who's had encounters with this with the Falk monster and the folks the Falk monster is i had somebody ask me yesterday say is he still around i did a uh worked yesterday with some folks that they're doing a documentary from texla uh crypt cryptozoology uh, crypt uh research there and so they're doing a documentary and uh, some of the people that were there at monster Mart says he's still here oh yeah and so well, they went out last night uh, they were down there at Falk. I was down there uh, at Smith Park where they did a lot of the, the research and stuff. And they got a lot of activity last night. They got rocks thrown. They got trees knocked. They had one about 15 yards inside the, the wood line of the perimeter that was sitting there that I think trying to intimidate them. Either the, the Bigfoot had gotten separated or something like that. But uh, they're going to put this documentary on. It's going to be very, very good. They're going to show people how, what they do during a, uh, it's not going to just be about Bigfoot, but what they do to do a research uh, thing right there. They're going to go out there and show you what they do as far as for putting out the cameras, as far as for, and they do, man, the th great thing about these guys, they build their own equipment. And man, they've got some equipment there that's just so impressive. And uh, you, I mean, you could hear a gnat sneeze from 300 yards with their parabolic disease, I mean, with their parabolic dish, you know. And uh, so it's one of those things that, that just really, really impressed with these guys. And, and again, so anybody thinks the Falcon Monster is, is not still going on, it's still going on. And I think it'll go on until the good Lord decides he wants to come back and, you know, and, and take us all up there with him because the Falcon Monster, I've had some, I hadn't had the encounters, but I've had a few howls down there this year when I was just down there driving through the, driving through the woods. We've had a lot of rain and uh, I didn't have my voice, 
but I was listening to my truck and had some howls that were heard there, maybe a few tree knocks and things like that. So Falcon Steel Reel, it's, it's, in my opinion, even more than Bluff Creek, it's the mecca of big footing right here because it's by everyday people that are still having uh, having encounters. Yep. I agree with you. And, you know, the uh, even if the original folk monster isn't with us, there's other folk monsters that are still living in that area. So, And, you know, as far as, like, being able to find evidence there's all kinds of evidence people just need to know what to look for and i was on uh formerly twitter x earlier today and there's some young lady on there that's got a hey i walk around the woods looking for bigfoot evidence channel and she's got this video and it's a hardwood tree looked like a popple about six inches thick across the base uprooted nowhere near the hole it came out of in fact she couldn't find the hole it came out of whole tree and like I said, well, some skeptic is probably saying it tried to get up for a walk and just lost its balance and <laughs> fell over or something. But uh, we know that uh, trees do not uproot themselves. <laughs> okay. So what exactly could rip a tree that's six inches thick out of the ground, roots and all, and go walk off with it? I've, I have found trees down there that were like some of the ones you see in Alaska that have been planted upside down into the ground. There's up there one of the habits that they have down in Falk down there around the swamps there. They actually pick up cypress trees. I mean, trees, not just little bushes, some of them 60 feet tall. And they'll take and they'll lean those cypress trees at an angle up against the oak trees, just like that right there. We got one area that's got probably 15 to 20 of them down there that are like that. And you can't find the stump because the stump's not there. They've actually been carried in there. So again, that that the the creatures that you that are the beings that you have in there are just they're just still so big and so massive. And about the, I've seen probably the fountain monster and his kinfolk or whatever maybe seven different times. And most of those times, it wasn't just in the sighting of an individual Bigfoot. There was a sighting a lot of times of two or three, and then a, a, or of a mama with babies. So like you said, it may not be the original fountain monster. But the clan is doing well. They're still reproducing. They're still being seen. And uh, like I said, by credible people, not just people who's, you know, who, who people think, oh, well, these guys are crazy. No, man, like I said, these are your 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 officials. These are people. Uh, I got to interview the sheriff not too long ago. I think I told you on your show, but got to interview the man who was sheriff and deputy. He said, man, the impressive thing was when people called us that had never even heard of the fountain monster, had never even heard of things that were going on and reported an encounter. And so I asked him, I said, well, tell me something. I said, is there an unwritten rule that says with law enforcement when somebody reports uh, an encounter that, that it's automatically just to be uh, just dismissed and discarded? He goes, wasn't down here in Falk. He said, when we got a report, he said, we went and we stayed on it until we either found some evidence or we got it debunked. And that's what another thing that makes this story so real of the Falk Monster and the Legend of Boggy Creek. You had actual law enforcement down here uh, with people they had grown up with and they lived with, and they were trying to find the secret to what this, uh, to what the, the monster was. And so to, to hear him, I interviewed him for three and a half hours, supposed to be an hour interview, and he was gracious enough to uh, to sit there and give me that long of an interview and anything I wanted to ask. So, man, I, and then I know a lot about this. It changed my life. I did a lot of research on the Fountain Monster, talked to bunches and bunches of people, but this guy had so much information that that I didn't know about. And I had such a deeper appreciation for the job that he did. His name is H.L. Phillips. And uh, you'll see him a lot of times in a lot of these documentaries. And, and so but for what he shared with me and the, the insight that I gained into what was going on there, man, it's just invaluable to me because this is something that means a lot to me because as y'all heard me say, you put a point right there from the minute before I saw the Fat Monster in 1977 and everything has happened since then and the way that he just, you know, so openly described it. And uh, man, I wouldn't take anything far that I've actually got it recorded on, a, on an SD card and, uh, when I get the opportunity to speak with him, maybe I can get it transcribed and maybe send to maybe to you, Luke, or something like that. I'll let you read some of the excerpts from there because it's going to really surprise you how many accounts there were that we just didn't see with the movie. Well, God bless them for having the balls to actually get involved. You don't see a lot of that from law enforcement because they're too scared to get to be ridiculed. Hey, Another that's... example of that that we got from up here in Montana is there was this county sheriff and he had so many Bigfoot reports coming in and he took them seriously and him and his guys would go out and investigate them, find out what they could find out. And 
you know, he wasn't like a believer going into this or anything. He was just open-minded. People are seeing something weird. I'm in charge of this county, and keep in mind, a county in Montana is about the size of an average state. Right. So he's got a lot of land to cover. (laughs) And so he was, you know, being honest about it, looking into it and everything. Well, by the time he left office and retired as a sheriff, he was so convinced it was real, he started his own Bigfoot research organization and turned out a book on all of the sightings and reports that he had gotten in that area. And and they're out there. There's not a week goes by that I don't get, and I'm so thankful to these people for that, that I don't get two or three people that respond to me through through Facebook or Facebook Messenger or something like that with another report of something that's happened to them. That, that man, it generally starts out, let me start out to say, I was not a believer in Bigfoot. And then it goes from there. And then whenever it ends at the end, they have now, they're not a believer anymore. You know what they are? They're a knower. They're a knower. Not just a believer. They're a knower. And and I'm so thankful for those people who do contact me like that because uh, I'm, I've known it for a long time. And for a long time, I couldn't talk about it because it was just looked at with such disdain. You know, and finally it got to where it was, was fashionable to where you could actually talk about your Bigfoot encounter. And then it was like almost a, a, a support group whenever I finally got to talk about it, all the weight was lifted off my shoulders. And again, being a UPS man, I had a, my area was generally probably 70 miles in two directions. So 140 miles, however you would go through that right there. And the number of people I met in those directions there who'd had some kind of encounter the same way. So, uh, so, and, and I always tell folks, folks, if, if you're looking for somebody say, well, if Bigfoot exists and if Bigfoot does this, you're on the wrong channel. Bigfoot does exist. And I don't say that with any kind of a, any kind of a meanness towards anybody or anything like that. Bigfoot is real. When you get out there at the right place and you'll see, and when you do, it's yeah. going to change. It's going to change. Took me 30 years to make a believer out of my wife, love her to death. Took me 33 to make a believer out of my father-in-law until he found his own track down there in the woods of Fowl that was not there whenever we walked down there. And when it came back, it was there. So, so again, it's it's one of those things that I appreciate these people for having the guts to open up to us like that. And, and I'm glad that we now have that avenue. And like I said, I appreciate them and I appreciate you all for listening to, uh, to, to things that, that I try to bring to you all. I try to share, as does Duke, and so does Stephen and Daniel. Everything that happens to us, we try to bring to you. So if you can't get out into the woods, we can at least kind of keep you posted as to what's going on. So so I appreciate them. And again, I didn't get to thank our service people and our first responders a while ago. But I jumped right in, uh, kind of stuck my foot in my mouth. But thank you all to those, too, because, I mean, especially the ones that are down there guarding our border right now. Yeah, we need a lot more of them, and God bless them. That's you know, exactly where's, right. Where's those sniper towers and fences? <laughs> but anyway, uh, <clears throat> getting back to Bigfoot-related subjects, okay. uh, I find it interesting that the uh, some of the stuff that comes up, you know, for a long time it was there's no such thing as Bigfoot. Bigfoot might exist, and then you get these, in the event that Bigfoot does exist type of TV yeah. shows for 20, 30 years of that garbage. And, uh, you know, and then now you've got the ones where they flat, it's, it just state flatly, Bigfoot exists. Yeah. Here's pictures, here's video, here's what we know. So now you run into this other interesting thing, and me and Blaine just talked about this in the, in the last episode, where uh, you've got somebody going, well, we have Bigfoot DNA, so that's all the proof we need. Bigfoot's real. We don't need to do any research on them. Oh, really? Yeah. So Blaine's talking about something that he observed Bigfoot behavior, and I just stopped him dead in his tracks, and I went, how did you figure that out? I'm looking at Bigfoot DNA or from being around Bigfoot and watching their behavior. So, yeah, yeah the first step is just proving they're real. Then That's we've right. got a butt-ton of work being out in the field, following them around, and figuring out what they're up to. Or if you're lucky enough that you can find one that speaks English and doesn't mind talking to you, you could ask them questions. <laughs> but that ain't going to come up very often. Trust me on that. One. <laughs> no, it's not. Especially me, because I'm not going to stick around too long. You know, what they want to talk about, they may be talking about fat boys that look like a tempting rotisserie chicken. In that case, I'm gone the other way. But, but it is, It's like you said, with, with what you've talked about right there, and, and uh, as, as far as for Bigfoot being real. And, uh, Man, when you see the effect on some of these people, when you interview them, I've been I've probably done over 200 interviews now with people. And like I said, you see the the tears well up in their eyes and you see their blood pressure go up and you see them start to shake. And then they they can't get a deep breath. And you realize something's happened to these people. It's not because they're sitting there inventing the story. This is actually this is an involuntary reaction. They can't help themselves whenever that thing happens to them. They can't help themselves. And sure enough, it's. uh, 
And that's one of the ways you can tell when you're doing an interview with a witness that's had any anything like a traumatic experience, right. just by the reaction of them telling the story. If they that's don't right. have a any kind of uh, emotional reaction, you can pretty much just count it as they're making up some hooey. Because you know, me and William, you're what well, you started 47 years ago. I had my first sighting 47 years ago, and it it was until about like three years ago before the PTSD started wearing off. Oh, and yeah. the only reason it did is because somebody made a pretty good mock-up of what it looked like that I could look at occasionally to the yep. point where it doesn't freak me out really bad to see that damn thing anymore. There you go. But I was still freaked out for, you know, the better part of 50 years <laughs> before it started wearing off. Yeah. That's also why I'm so durable to seeing regular Bigfoot because, like, no, they're not even scary compared to that thing. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And my first one was, that I saw was seven and a half or eight feet tall. Folks, I've seen uh, probably six now that are over nine foot and two over 10 foot. And when you start looking at those things, you realize, you know, I might have just saw a, a mediocre juvenile or an adolescent to realize just how big they were. And if anybody would told me back then, well, they get bigger than that, I thought, man, you're crazy. And like I said, the only thing I could compare it to was Andre the Giant. But uh, after I've you know, been, been researching, like you said, getting out, who's bringing this evidence in there? People who are researchers who are continuing to go out there and you see these nine and a half and ten and a half footers and you can swear to their veracity that they do. They have 22 and 23 inch footprints and you're yeah. like, oh, my gosh, you know, so. So that's and a, even bigger ones like and that, even whatever bigger. it was that left that 31 inch track that I found that's last May. Yeah. And God hope I never run into it, whatever it was. <laughs> you know, my, my biggest ones that I found are, are I've found two that are 22. I found one that's 21. I found about four that are 20. And they're, you know, they don't appear to, appear to be the same creature. And, uh, and but you realize what kind of, of uh, being it's going to take to make a footprint that big. And I'm at that time, one of them, I was 280 pounds and I barely <laughs> a quarter of an inch worth of dent. This thing was going in an inch and a half in this hard dirt, not soft dirt or soft sand, but hard dirt. And you realize, oh, my gosh, you know, this uh, I've actually underestimated what the uh, and, and I know it is real and actually underestimated how how big they could actually get. So so again, like I said, I don't say that bragging just I'm very fortunate to live in a good area where we have the uh, we have an abundance of animals here down here and there are Bigfoot, whatever you want to say. I'm not trying to disparage anybody where they want animals, people just as a general term, we have an abundance of Bigfoot down here. Lots of forest people. Yeah, yeah and there's an, here's another thing. If you haven't found a whole bunch of tracks, you might be amazed at how much difference there is in just a few inches of a track. That's like, right. I'm really used to finding 16, 17 inch tracks. Right. I find what's like oh, average Bigfoot, average Bigfoot track. And I start finding something like 19 inches long or something. Right. That looks really a lot bigger than a 16 inch track does. You can tell right away when you look you at betcha. it. And then you start finding something that's 22 inches long. You're second guessing yourself, going, is that even a track? That's right. And when, when it's you know so that, big, you know. Yeah, and it, it is so big, you know. And and thing is, you know, that not all tracks. Falcon Monster was known for having three toed tracks, but about 15 and a half, 16 and a half inches. But I've seen so, so we have the four toed track and the five toed tracks up here. And like I said, them jokers at 22 inches long and the toes doggone four inches long. You're like, oh my gosh, you know. So, uh, and it's just, uh, it's almost beyond your comprehension because there may be no limit how big they are it's just what we found so yeah <laughs> well an example of that let's go back to the blaine episode again blaine's doing that pan to his left and he gets that huge one standing down at the end of the right. gravel pit watching yep. and he scales it up because he sees the tree it's standing next to it and he goes and compares the image and that thing's 16 17 feet tall yeah okay well it gets even scarier because Christy was just looking at that picture and she was playing around with Photoshop and lightened up the background and looked up above him. There's two more heads of even bigger ones yeah. behind and above him. You so know, how big do they get? I don't want to know. Well, that's a, <laughs> I know get, Robin was talking to the ones that I have up here where we went camping. And I was actually talking to her about the size of their structures and, and you know, going like, judging by the size of their structures, some of these guys have got to be at least 14 feet tall, like lag size. And she said, one of them's laughing. And I go, what's so funny? And he said, we're eight, we get up to 18 feet tall. You know, and, and it's, it's, it's hard for us to comprehend, but we're just really starting to learn more. Yes, we've had DNA now, you know, and even then with the DNA, we had some people didn't accept the DNA as true. 
But now we have that. And then people who are in the woods, I, I try to still try to get in the woods. I haven't this year because I've been ill with uh, that respiratory infection, but I try to get in the woods at least five days a week. Or if not, I'm driving the roads looking and some of the things I'm finding are just like the ones, the, the structures that you had in Montana. The only way you can describe them is colossal, colossal <laughs> the Coliseum, how big they really were. And, Thank uh, you. And you know that really, I feel bad because we try to present that to you guys with film and it just doesn't work. I mean, you get kind of get the idea from seeing it on video, but until you're actually standing there in person and then it's just like, whoa, I don't want to be here. Let's leave. That's the first thing you think of. Yeah. And it's, it's six foot, two inches tall, and you're looking up as it's built to where it crosses up there like that. And you've still got 30-something feet before you ever find any of the, two, the trees first touching each other where they've built these these structures together. So, so again, really, uh, really, really impressive. Colorado tends to have some. But the yeah. rest of them don't have like what you have there in Montana. They just don't seem to be big. It's, it's I, building materials. Honestly, I feel jealous that you found some upside-down trees down there because I've heard there are some here in Montana, but I've never seen one yet. And and oh yeah, and it's it's like they're done with a post hole digger. They just yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> How the hell are they cramming the top of the tree yeah. into the ground six feet? You know. And one of those I found, it kept getting. I don't know if it was another a Bigfoot that was trying to push it down, or whether or not it was just uh, the the shape, the uh, consistency of the ground. But it started getting to where it was leaning. So I was looking at that. I came back a couple days later, and this thing had actually come in and straightened it back up. It's almost. <laughs> Truly, that's the truth. I've got the pictures of it to prove it, and you know I do, man. I'm, <coughs> I'm like little guys there on that Crocodile Dundee movie when he's in the subway, and they're all taking pictures. That's kind of how I am now. I'm obsessed with that. But but it is, and he actually goes in and re-straightens up that this tree that he's jabbed into the ground. This and is it's hilarious. Just, I can confirm that from up here. Sunny was up here. She's from Alaska, and she was camping on the same site where you and me were. Uh -huh. You go across the road. And up the hill a little ways to where their observation spot is. Wow. Right in between there, there's a kind of a small X structure. And I said, well, let's go up there and see if that X structure is still there. That was there a couple of years ago. But it, it was kind of falling down like one side was leaning too much. Wow. You wow. could tell it wasn't natural, something to put it in place. But it wasn't perfectly symmetrical anymore. So when we walked up there, it was perfectly symmetrical. And you could see where one of them had been drugged. Like within a day or so before we got there into position to cram back in the ground again. Yep. Like, what are they going around? Straightening up everything? So it's up to specs. So I walk up there with my white trench coat and my clipboard on and go, mm, extraction, perfectly <laughs> proportioned. Well done. You're going to need for that. You know? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and that's a clue. It's not just random to these things the way they do. It's not just, they're just, you know, they may be doing it sometime to pass the time, but they actually mean something to them. And we're, we're trying to, all of us that are researching those things, trying to find out what they do mean. You know, we kind of have an idea with the X and stuff. Then we have some down here that look like modern art that they could go into modern art music or then sometimes we find parentheses that are parallel like what you see oh yeah uh, you know and uh, you it's find just, any of those big jungle gym setups down there yes sir i'm if fact, you get show. up here again i got to take you to this one that bear downey found when he was up here with me and it's like three blocks long oh yeah <laughs> oh my god and, and is it a, somewhere for the kids to play you don't know yeah. I, because that's kind of what it looks it's like. It's just impossible to walk through. Everything is bent around trees and twisted yeah, exactly. and all kind and almost none of it is from there. It's been drug in from somewhere. That's right. And that's another way you can tell about the structures when it's not the kind of wood that you have that's native to the woods that's around you but been drug in, then you can get an idea. That, again, that's what it is. It's been brought in. There used to be piles up there for one that me and my wife found and they were adding to it on a daily basis. And we were actually finding some of the piles of wood that they brought together and just kind of tossed just basically inside the uh, the tree line there and we're using that to drag there into the woods and to, to use their structures on so so again like i said there, it's not just something random with what these things do it's it actually means something to them yes uh, and, and that's why you see it all over the place all across the continent over in Europe, in Siberia, and Igor Burtz have got an asterisk structure in Siberia that looked exactly like something I could have taken a picture of in my research area here in yeah. Montana. Yeah. And to back you up on what you are talking about earlier with the cypress tree that had been ripped out and was leaning up against the big oak tree. Yeah. One of my friends up here found this valley that had never been logged because it was too difficult to get to. So it's still got all the old growth in there. We're talking four or 500 years old trees. Right. You can imagine how big those are. Somebody had decided to do the same thing with those. 
and they had ripped out the full-size lodgepole pines like they make the structures out of here and leaned them against this tree and made this half teepee out of full-size log lodgepole uh, pines. Yeah. And he said just seeing that was so scary, he turned around and left right away. You know, you're, you're, that's one thing about, I tell people when you see Bigfoot, that's one thing you're not prepared for is the size of these creatures, something that's four feet wide. I've got, I sent you a picture here. I hope it turned out well, but we got one right there standing in front of my camera. It's four foot across the doggone shoulders. You know, I, and I'm, you know, I'm a former bodybuilder, 6'2", and I'm still about 270, two something like that. I mean, it makes me look like a dwarf, and you're not prepared. And then when you see the size trees that they pick up and they manipulate, like like the old uh, Lincoln Logs or things like that, that they manipulate into the structures and the design, and it just actually takes your breath away. Like, how smart are these, are these Bigfoot, and how strong are these Bigfoot? And we really don't, you know, so we really don't know. Thank goodness they don't have the aggressive chimp that they could have. If I was that big, y'all, man, y'all have to put chains on me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have some people from my young days of childhood, man, I would be going after, I guarantee you. Like the guy who said, that if you ever became a werewolf, what would you want? He said, give me a pencil and paper. I said, why, man? You make out your will. He said, no, list of people I'm going to buy. It. Well, the same way if I was Bigfoot, I'd go back through there and I'd have some, I'd have some, uh, some remedies to take care of as far as that. But but again, in, in saying that, just and the, the disposition they have, we're very fortunate because I'm sure there's some that, that don't get reported. There's some that are rogues. I've had a couple of rogue encounters like that. But but at that, to be, uh, I've watched them with their, their infants. I've watched them around some of the other members of their troop before. And like I said, the way they treat each other is just like something that we would do with a good old bunch of buddies sitting there watching a ball game or a bunch of ladies, you know, doing uh, the things that you ladies do. They have such a compassion for each other. And, and to be able to feel that and see that, man, you're just like blown away. So, uh, so uh, again, uh, very, very fortunate. And I say that in a very humble way. Uh, most of the time that you have an encounter, we have some every now and then that, that are intentional because we've got the right area we spend the time to but then all of a sudden you sometimes luck into one like the one i saw the twin seven footers that day walking down the edge of the woods like i said they were actually pushing on each other like brothers do you know playing around there and then whenever me and stephen got to the woods and on the way back and the the, the uh, alarm system on the one that was going to our our cell phone cameras was already going off. They were already back into the, the field right there while me and Stephen were walking back to our vehicles and there ends up being seven in the field at the same time. So, uh, and like I said, to watch how they interact with each other, it's, it's just the most, in my opinion, it's the most amazing thing that we have out there. And, and again, like I said, so smart that all these years has never been documented, quote, documented, let's put it yeah, that way. They do a good job uh, of avoiding us. Speaking of just random weird things happening, this, that just for some reason jogged my brain and made me think of something that we probably never really talked about on the show. And that was at some point in the past, me and William have done a lot of shows and I went, can you please just go film some stock video? Just yeah. walk down the side of the road, aim the camera into the woods, film some stock video. So when you're talking about the woods, I can show people that don't live down there what your woods looks like so yep. they know what you're talking about so william's totally obliging and he goes out and he films three pieces of stock video and sometime later i'm showing him to kelly shaw rocky mountain sasquatch and he goes jokes there's a bigfoot right there there's one right over there on the other side of that pond <laughs> what <laughs> so then i went back and looked at the other videos that you said and the other one had a bigfoot in it too he was crouching down in the woods watching you walk past him and i'm like hey william i just said stock video not video with bigfoot in it <laughs> You know, and, and I did some of those that were so quick. Uh, my our videos that I sent to you got stolen by somebody had just disappeared. So that's I went down there just real quick, but an area I knew, and and to show a stock video, and it's a good looking area too. And then all of a sudden, then y'all begin to find the Bigfoot in there. I hadn't had time yet to go back through there. Then. Well, that's and, my point. You know, it's easy for us to believe that you're legit because you go to film stock video, and there's Bigfoot in the stock video, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I said, it's not on my private land. One thing that Stephen, <coughs> Hill, and Daniel and I do, we go to public land uh, around here. And that's, I've got some people like, like my friend Shannon Cruz. He lets me on his property. He's got them on his property. But to go around here to some of the wildlife management areas or to some of the national forests or like what we went to up there in Montana and to have encounters with these things, it's just the most amazing thing 
that, that you can do that. And uh, if, if I don't have uh, uh, access uh, by permission to a property, man, sometimes I just pull off on the side of the road, find a place where I can get my truck over safely, kind of wait for a little bit and then do a little calling or else uh, I'll even call blasting. Or sometimes you just sit. All you have to do is just sit there. Then all of a sudden you hear them sneaking through the woods wanting to see what you are, what you're sitting there with. And, uh, man, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, how is this going to end up? Thank goodness, knock on wood. So far, it's all in good, but I want to keep I want to keep my streak going. I was telling you earlier that I sent uh, MK Davis that one clip where we were coming out from the teepee and they were back there whistling, trying to get us to come back in the woods again. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Well, that was a great hey, are you leaving already? Come back. Whistle, 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 whistle. <laughs> That, that show that y'all did together, like I said, if y'all didn't have a chance to watch that, go back and watch that. Uh, MK and Duke together, all the knowledge you had there on the on the same show, it was just so impressive. And uh, MK is a very humble man too, as well. He had a lot of what he, most of what he does is on his own dime. I don't know of anybody that's really monetized to go out and research Bigfoot, but y'all go back and watch that show, and uh, you'll see him and Duke dissecting some things. You got. A picture of MK there is a picture of scale for him with the Bigfoot. And there's like a, a, a 10 or 11 footer back there in the background, twice as tall as what MK is. So y'all go back and watch that because, man, that was that was really an impressive show. And to have uh, two guys with the knowledge that you had there in that show, it's uh, it's just really something that, uh, that what has it got now, 10,000 views, maybe something? Yeah, like and just that. under a week, it's got 10,000 views. Just under My favorite week. part in it is the uh, the the tire fight between the two regular size ones that are only eight feet tall yep. and then like the 15 footer walking out breaking it up yeah. Yeah, trying to take a nap <laughs> you know and, and coincident with that what was the one down there the lake worth monster what was his very what seemed famous for picking up tires and throwing tires at people because all oh, that never happened then you look at the video that him that mk there and show i said they've got tires there and this one is just disciplined and these other two they're two foot taller than what we are as humans and this <laughs> big giant walks up and he says, all right, kids, cut it out. You know, yeah. things just giant so, comes up and breaks it up. But he's like twice as tall as they are, if not exactly. tall. Exactly. So that was, that was, that's something that if, if anybody hasn't seen it, please go back and watch that because uh, I said, very, very knowledgeable. And it will give you an insight to the, the that uh, there's alphas in their groups, you know, but the, the alphas, uh, they, they discipline the others kind of like what we have here. I mean, where things get kind of out of line like that. So, so again, that was something that I really enjoyed. Uh, and, and, and some of the guests that, that Duke has had on there and some, like I said, with Blaine, he's going to have Blaine. So Blaine gets, he probably gets more pictures than anybody. And I'm just so impressed with what he gets because I do get a lot of pictures, man. We've got an area there that we get a lot, the blind gets them just all the time. And yeah. uh, well, those of us that can actually get pictures have an appreciation for how really hard it is yeah. to do that. And when you see somebody that can practically get them constantly, it's like, wow, are you good? You know, well, that plus they trust you. Or they wouldn't be anywhere near you and you wouldn't be getting pictures of them. See, and that's true. That's something I think everybody talks about. Well, you know, you're, they'll, they'll kill me. Boy, you're just a Bigfoot magnet. No, man, I've gone up there. I've never done anything to betray their trust. I've never gone up there shooting at them. I tend to leave them uh, some kind of a, a, a treat or something other like that right there. So, again, like I said, whenever I pull up there, a lot of times you'll hear them walking to the edge inside the wood line. And then you'll kind of see some of the movement. But like I said, my wife goes down there. She's there. 10 minutes to get your first picture uh, where we was, were sitting down there and there was the mama and then had the two babies there right there at her knees. So after they learn to trust you, they do have that trust. And and that's why some of these other shows that go in there for one day and try to film something that you, they don't have any, you know, any Bigfoot there to show you. And then you got guys, you know, like the ones that we were talking about here, the Bigfoot have a trust in you. And, uh, and once they learn to trust you, then you're not, they're not going to make themselves quite as, whether they may let they, people say, you know, you didn't see a Bigfoot, Bigfoot lets you see them. And that's what it is, is Bigfoot lets you see them, especially when you've got you know, infants involved. We, uh, For the most part, I think that's true. You get the occasional rare sighting where you're just in the right place at the right time. But, you know, usually when you see one, it's that they just don't give a rip and they're letting you see them. Or even right. worse, they want you to leave. And that, that's yeah. why they're letting you see them. <laughs> Yeah, they've made that plain to me a time or two as well, too. Sometimes it took me a little bit longer to get away, but by the time they started knocking on trees, throwing sticks, throwing rocks, <laughs> and that kind of stuff, I'm like, it won't take me long to get to my truck. Just give me just a little bit. I'm getting old, so just give me a little bit of extra time there. But and you're like, uh, so do you guys want me to leave? And you're this, 
<laughs> okay, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, and, and it sounds like we're, we're making light, but, but we're not. It's just, it's just that way. They just have their way of, of, of letting you know whether they're going to accept you or whether or not they want you to get out of their territory. When they want you out of their territory, you will get out of their territory. That is There's a, another thing to keep in mind there. That's situational, too, because you could have a really great relationship with a local group. They trust you. They like you as much as they trust or like any human. And then you go up there one time and all of a sudden they're like aggressive and weird and you get this negative vibe. Trust your gut. Leave. It might have nothing to do with them. There could be something really dangerous in their area and they want you to get the hell out of there so you don't get hurt. That's exactly right. You know, me and Steve in that area, we've been in, we've been researching it at Brown Zero for five years. I went up there last year and one come bouncing down the hill one day and I set up some cameras and you could hear him you over know, treading through the rush watching me. Then finally you could hear him as he leaves going back up the hill. I come back the next week down there to where to, to check my cameras and this thing comes about, if it may not have been the same one, it comes bouncing down the hill and he is upset with me for being there. And he continuously makes his presence known with grunts, with limb snaps and things like that. I could actually see him and the fur as he's walking between some of these spaces and where he stops. And you get that feeling on the back of your neck that makes your, your hair stand up. up. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, and I had two pistols that day, not for Bigfoot. I had two pistols for hogs and everything else too. I actually pulled those pistols out that day because I became so uneasy with well, the way this Bigfoot was acting. Was he rogue? Was something going on? Or was it going to be something like you said that was going to hurt me, whatever it was, you know? So I took it and I backed up the hill to get away from there because it was just so unnerving, something I'd never experienced before, but this is a group that Steve and I have been around, you know, for, for five good years now or more, you know? And uh, so, so that's kind of the way it happens. You just kind of got to play it by ear. Nothing is ever the same. They're still uh, kind of like people. There's good people and bad people. There's people that have bad days. I don't want to meet one that has a bad day. No. I want all days to be good days. <laughs> and they, they, they live longer than us too. So their idea of how long it may take to make up their mind about how much they want to trust you. That usually surpasses by a wide margin your average human's amount of patience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in other words, you will give up and quit going out in the woods way before they decide that they like you and they're going to have anything to do with you. I tried to figure out since I saw that first in 1977, then some, and there was one that was seen in 1972, right there, uh, less than 100 yards from where I was, seen by a preacher and his grandson, and I was trying to figure out that, and then some of the latest sightings that we had. If it is the same one, he's at least 70 years old. People say, oh, well, that's crazy. Let me give you an example. If those of you, I'm of the years whenever Johnny Wisemutter played Tarzan and you had Cheetah and Jane and all that. Cheetah lived to be 80 years old before it finally died. Wisemutter yeah. made 79. But they do. They have that long lifespan. Man, there's a lot of things that they remember during that time right there. So uh, so they have that longer lifespan. It does, it does make a difference. And... Uh, you know, they, if you have one in captivity, the, the chimps or whatever we have there in captivity, they tend to live longer than those that are out there in the wild as a rule. But then every now and then you have one out there in the wild, man, he's just the, you know, he's the grand poobah of the whole deal in the way he's lived. So it, it's really interesting uh, when you start checking. That's one thing that I have really tried to look into in comparing uh, areas that where you've had sightings and what the creature looked like and if it was the same one and, and to find that, uh, these things are living 50 and 60 years easy. Oh, yeah, they're living a lot longer than we are. Than that. That's right. Uh, Christy's got one down there. As a matter of fact, you've heard his voice before. Oh, I have. And yeah. he is turning 142 uh, in, during this month. Let's just put it that way. And uh, that's one thing I discussed with these men last night right here with TextLive uh, Cryptozoology Research there. And they have one again that all of a sudden that's uh they're they're down and recording one of them goes hey like that and he's like they played it again hey and it's actually hey like that and it goes, <laughs> does it know what it's saying maybe maybe not yeah some people do because really they've been listening to us long enough and watching yeah. us the one i just referenced he's been hanging around to the same family for three generations right grandpa's <laughs> dead dad's old and son is like middle-aged and he's hanging around with him now this one, he can speak good English, too. You know, and we know for a fact, if you've listened to some of these uh, recordings, they do have a syllabic language. They have their own language. My dogs have a language that they understand. You know, when when they bark, I and all the cats in the neighborhood that go to meow, and it's the dogs that all around the different houses, you all of a sudden start answering each other. And I can tell one of my dogs here, you know, go get your brother, get do something other, and he will go 
in there into the bedroom, you'll know, bark. I mean, that's and that's the truth. So they have a language they understand. They have their own language with each other. I've heard it before, and it does sound somewhat like samurai chatter. But then they've got also a language that means get the heck out of these woods before I decide to come out. <laughs> and that's the one that uh, that I tend to listen for the most right there because it's uh, it's pretty awesome and it does carry some volume to it. Like I said, when your clothes start shaking like that, whenever you hear that noise, you realize it's it's not just the wind. It's uh, it's something they're telling you you need to get the heck out of Dodge. So, well, so. I got an early warning for you guys now. We've been playing them that song by Bro Smith a lot to the point where they really like it. Uh-huh. Some of them know the words. And oh, when yeah. they're playing it, you can hear them in the woods singing along with it. So if you guys are out camping somewhere and you hear that coming out of the woods, it ain't Bro Smith singing it. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably want you to leave because Bigfoot's coming, going to get you, going to get you. <laughs> Bigfoot's coming, so you better watch out. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's amazing, and, and we laugh at that. But, you know, it may be even deeper than that what all they can do. We just don't know. And that's a, uh, and so we got to keep an open mind. Even folks of us who get out in the woods all the time, keeping an open mind. Nobody knows everything. We, sir, I certainly don't. I, and there's things that are classic Bigfoot behavior you'll see. Uh, and everybody said, well, you don't know anything until you can get out there where you got one in captivity. Yeah, as a rule, that's true. But then you see in a, a behavior that they do that tends to be, uh, mimicked by other Bigfoot and other locales. And you realize, hey, that's something that they actually do uh as as part of their makeup and, and yeah. when you find that right there and i always i always make a star and, and an asterisk right there you know because that's something that that we can see that's well, where does this kind of stuff start i mean you got uh you know field researchers and the uh primates anthropoids uh apes fossey people like that well they're the ones that went out and spent all the time with them in the woods and learned about them firsthand right that's where your best information came from Yep. So, again, it's the field researchers that get the best information because they're the ones that are actually there with them, doing their level best to try and observe them as much as they can. And, you know, and as much as uh, gorillas and chimpanzees are slime right. elusive, they're like friggin' tanks with neon paint on them compared yeah, to a Bigfoot. Yep. Yeah, they're just, just a, they're actually a mini scale down version. Look what they can do. You yeah. Know, from- uh, compared but the Bigfoot to some, are so much smarter and so much more elusive than those critters are. And and the first time they went in to try and find these chimps in this one area, they went in there and walked around that area for two weeks and couldn't find track, uh, dropping, nothing. Uh, the chimps just avoided them. They were staying away from where they were. Yep. They were there. Yep. They couldn't find them, though. <laughs> you know, and, and that's what's amazing about Bigfoot. You know, they... Uh, People say, well, I don't know if I've got them in my area. Well, you know, if you're not just out there looking, sometimes it'll take you a while to find out. But uh, another other people say, oh, well, they don't want to be around us us people. That's not so, man. Like I said, we're their entertainment. They uh, end up, uh, I think, actually enjoying being around us at times, you know. And uh, I've got, man, story after story of people who have them coming up in their flower beds. I have a, a friend of mine that I wrote about in my book there that was out there camping and they had brought their little Labrador retriever out there, and at about three o'clock in the morning, he'd gotten off work, so he was a long haul driver. He was sleeping. His wife hears the dog chain out there rattling. She goes, and there's this dog, this puppy, this Labrador retriever puppy, and about a five foot baby Bigfoot, and they're sitting there playing shadow with each other. She, <laughs> now this is true, and she said that thing reached up and said he put his hand on my dog and just kind of switched it like that, playing with him. Said the dog went about twenty feet through the air, rolled up there and got up like, how the heck did that happen? You know, but like I said, it wasn't one of those bad encounters that happens with dogs with Bigfoot. So uh, so again, it's just, it's just really a and, she, and she's as honest as the day is long, man. I mean. Uh, it, with that story right there. And so uh, when you hear something like that, that's one that just kind of makes me laugh. I'm actually glad because I have a friend down here named Doyle Holmes. This didn't happen good for him. He had a whole litter of puppies and a cane corso. And evidently the dog may have gotten too aggressive with the Bigfoot. The Bigfoot could have had a bad day, but actually killed his cane corso, slammed him against a tree, and then also killed the puppy. So you just don't know, you know. I said they're not teddy bears. They're not walking teddy bears. There. One thing to keep in mind, though, is they don't. They're not automatically hostile to dogs. That's Some right. of them actually really like certain dogs. Right. And what we've been able to figure out, it mainly has to do with the dog's attitude and demeanor. If the dog's really loud and aggressive, they, they're going to have problems with it. Yeah. 
And they don't like little yappy dogs, kind of like the movie here. Yeah, the yeah they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, See, that's why bears don't like dogs either. It's the noise. It's well, not yeah. that they're scared of the dog. It's the noise. Right. It's that's annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's annoying. I uh, man, as much as I love my dogs, when they get to doing that yappy stuff, I get to where it kind of gets on my last nerve too. <laughs> love them as I do. So, but it is, and that's why because they're not automatically <laughs> hostile to some dogs. You know, and I heard one guy say they didn't like black dogs and they didn't like. You know, pit bulls, maybe so, maybe not. But then for every story, there's a counter story that where the thing, you know, tends to tolerate. Uh, the friend of mine down here in Texarkana, there was a little beagle over there and he had eight big foot on his property. And uh, the big one was about 10 foot male. And he said this big one and this beagle were buddies. And so the beagle would go to chase the Bigfoot. Of course, he could outrun it and he would step into the woods and wait till this beagle came by and he would jump out at the beagle. And then the beagle would just jump up, turn aside. <laughs> and like I said, you could almost see him laughing. And this friend of mine, he said he's not an idiot. He was, I think he was an old pharmacist. So he's a very, very sharp man. But, uh, but he, uh, he would keep them. He said, and I never felt threatened the whole time. He would bring them. You and I have talked about, you know, bringing hostess cupcakes and those kind of things that were out of date. Or bringing bread, he said. I never felt threatened. I kept it down there. So really, really, really interesting. Uh, well, speaking of really interesting, we should get on to some of the cool pictures that you've gotten here recently. Which I is, hope so, uh, man. I hope one of the trying, reasons we wanted yeah. to get William on here was to show some of the cool pictures he's been getting. It's been it's been it's been good. We've been getting pictures now the since uh, about October the seventh. And again, I believe that the Bigfoot up here, because of these, these size baby tracks we've been finding since uh, about the December the 7th up here, I think they have their babies maybe here. And this is just think, but from what the evidence is showing, they have their babies here about the, the first week in December. So uh, we're going to get some here, hopefully, that's going to show up pretty good. Now, yeah, I'm ready to, to see some. I hope they turn out good enough to where uh, uh, folks will be able to see them and be impressed with them. All right. Well, let's go through them then. What do we got up here first? We'll do it. Okay. Uh, some really interesting ones that we got. Uh, I'm going to tell you there. We've got my friend, uh, Stephen's been really working hard. And so uh, I don't go there by myself very much anymore, just because like I've had this respiratory infection. Don't want to get there and pass out. And, you know, and y'all find, you know, man's found with, you know, Bigfoot throws in a tree or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh you know so but he he'll go with me but he hollered me out a log a good size log about four feet about four feet tall he hauled it out he cut off the top he put some hinges on there so you can just flap the lid shut just like this right here and then he cut me out a viewfinder right here we've got the cameras placed right there and so as it's sitting there looking out we've been uh there's several more pictures i have there that are, are, are as you see they were apparently coming through early in the morning but i've got two white baby bigfoot right there and one of them is sitting there looking at the camera the other is just right over his shoulder and i think there's probably an adult right there behind him but it didn't come in as clear but you can see the hand right there and this baby bigfoot is reaching up there because when the light comes on and he's got his hand there on the camera blocking that out so that's uh that's one that we have right there and like i said you can see them plain as day and they're white uh that's not the only white one that we've got and i got one couple of years ago a little albino bigfoot like that um, again, uh, I've got one there that's in front. We have a, a, a PVC tube feeder that I used to put my apples in whenever I feed them apples. And uh, so right there, and then he is standing right there behind this uh, tube feeder. And as I said, his shoulders are four feet wide. He's about he's about nine foot tall right there, where the from judging from the depth right there, from where I have the the camera built. Unless he's squatting down, he may be even taller than that. And I think it's the one we call Blackie, and he is just a whopper. But you can see him. You can see the shape of the head. Uh, so when you're looking at that one, also I got one there at nighttime uh, about three weeks ago, I guess. And you can see that he's come up there. And I, like I said, I generally put a spy camera on each side. So if it's the light from the other uh, spy camera, but you can see in his silhouette, the well, one you see the eyes that are glowing, the eyes are glowing like crazy. And he's sitting there and he's bent over like this here. You see the arm hanging back. You see just how wide he is. You see this other shoulder right there. And he's got this nasty look on his face, but it's so cool. Then I sent a picture also as that, as I'm finding it on my card reader to show you, hey, this ain't something that he's just devised. I've got it there on my card reader as i'm actually discovering this picture i'm like oh my gosh and his track with well, the track that i found there this was about 17 and a half inches i did find the one track right there so uh again so those are some of the ones that are really the, the most interesting that i've got i've got some that are in the process of being that i'll have to get cleaned up again uh, i'm gonna try to send them to duke 
and uh, he said he can clear them up and he can. But the you know, thing is, they don't pose for you. you just, you're just left with what you've got. Sometimes it's based on motion. Sometimes it's based on light to do to how well they show. But, but those three right there, I think, are probably the most interesting that we've got right there, there that, uh, that, that I sent there to y'all to see. And I've got some more, but like I said, just haven't got them uh, with uh, the sure. things I've been doing here. I right? hadn't got a chance to really get them worked on good, but it's going to get done. You, know, and you, you got a picture from when you were up here with me that we still need to get the original and do some more work on oh, yeah. that and show it to everybody. Yep. I've got one right there that I was sitting there as me and uh, as me and Eric were going off the, when we left you and Matt. We went one way, y'all went another, and I looked down there and I saw motion there between the tree. And I guarantee you that's a Bigfoot because it wasn't it wasn't always there when I went to look at it again. <laughs> when I get the picture, then I pull it back down, you know, for a second, and then I hold so they it. were on your left hand side as you were walking back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I that go, was where that ravine was with yeah. the slough in it. And, and, and they were following you guys to make sure you made it safely back again. And you and I talked about there being babies up there. We found yeah. baby tracks. You know, I mean, it was just as just as we supposed, but that right there, I saw it right there. And then when I went back to look again, I couldn't find this thing. It wasn't because I'd moved so far and I was out of a different direction. He was just gone. And so I knew it had to be a Bigfoot, and that was from Montana. So uh, if I can you know, but what I think is hilarious is we part company. Me and Mike go further out into the woods. You and Eric turn around come back. They follow you guys. Yep. They don't follow us going further out the woods. <laughs> they follow you guys. You know, and, and me and Eric was, I was like, man, Eric, I hope we put both our minds together and we find the right way back home because I don't want to be here wandering these woods in Montana with grizzlies and, and timber. Well, they were there. Stuff. They would just herd you in the right direction. If you went the wrong direction, they'd just get around in front of you and scare you. So you'd go back the right direction. You know, and, and I believe that. I believe that they do. I, I, I've told you before, I've got one up here, I think, that watches over me, keeps me from getting myself in trouble with these other ones. It appears to be a feature email and it protects me from these other ones and uh, like I showed you all the footprints and uh, when I'm there as soon as I get there the first thing I do uh, y'all heard me do my, my barred owl call and let them know that I'm there and it won't be too long you'll hear one that's inside the wood line they're walking through and I think that's what this is and so again protecting us through there I mean they're not all out to they're not all out to kill you you know no. and uh, the funny thing is when I feed them the Snickers bars and you know me and Steven we don't even unwrap the papers anymore and then all of a sudden you go through and you find the trail they're using there's a whole line of snickers bar paper. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hilarious i told they're my buddies that they didn't believe until they saw it man they just die laughing <laughs> daniel daniel will vouch for that daniel uh daniel becker from alaska he'll vouch for that right there so really 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 interesting things again i've got some more pictures that i will be sharing uh with, with duke and with y'all and i said just getting a chance to get back on here while i've had a voice so I can speak uh, before, like I said, being my wife wins every argument now because I hadn't been able to make any noise. <laughs> now, like Robbie on Little Rascal. So uh, I got to tell you, this is pretty funny. This is uh, me and Johnny last summer. I wanted to take him right over there to the same spot that I took you. We we're going to walk up to the end of the ridge and then go down to where the giant teepee was and then come back again. So as we go across the slough to the base of the ridge where you and me found all the baby tracks going up that ridge we're about to go up the ridge and from the other side of the slough not the side we just left going this way it's from over here whoop yep <laughs> and johnny goes did you hear that whoop and i went yeah <laughs> hey, we're going to see the teepee, guys. We'll be back in a little bit. Yeah, it's like they're trying to get us to go the opposite direction to where we want to go to. And it's like, well, I, thanks for letting us know you're over there, but we want yeah. to go see the teepee, and then we'll come back again. <laughs> and, and, and it is. They're, they're, they're so – they have their way of wanting you to do what – they, they want, want you. you to do <laughs> <laughs> rather than what you want to do yourself. And like, again, they don't lose many arguments. They can, they can feign like they're angry and get you. I had the one there that when I did the show there with travel channel there and I showed there the mama there that she has the baby, she's leaning out from behind the tree and I wouldn't leave and I could hear her over there. And then I would go to lean out, you know, be real slow, deliberate, trying to sneak around instead of just jumping over there. And then she would lean behind the tree so I couldn't see her, you know. So finally, I start getting these pine cones and I start getting these sticks and then I start getting the rocks. And when she starts throwing the rocks, they're, you know, they're a little bit more deadly with the rocks. Sticks going to kind of take its own little twist. But yeah. then finally, I start getting, ah, rah, rah, and I realize, hey, I don't want to leave right now, but it's probably a good idea that I do. Yeah. Like, 
she had a way of letting me and then come to find out you look at that picture you look in the middle of the chest and there's the baby and that's why i wonder why this woman was so aggressive with me because i spent a lot of time down there but that's what it was had that baby with her right there and uh and so they had she wanted me out of there and she got me out of there there's no doubt about it nice yeah it's interesting so you know again they're just they're as smart as we are and they're all individuals so there's no hard and fast rule for anything that's right. It's really a case by case. What's going on? Who you're dealing with? Did they have a bad day? Is there something else in the area? You know, there's all different kinds of variables that could be involved in something like this. And again, with the ones just whooping at us when we were going up the ridge line, what was why? Yeah. <laughs> Did they want us to know where they were and go that direction and play tag with them? Yeah. Was there something up there on the ridge they were trying to keep us away from, hoping that if they whooped, we'd go the opposite direction? And we didn't have any problems when we went up there. One peculiar thing that happened is after we went to the teepee, that slough on the far side of that ridge was actually dry enough that we could walk across it. Oh, wow. So we went across it. We went straight up that really steep hill on the other side. And we got up to the top of it. And we went over the crest. And we went down the far side of it. And then we were back at the slough where we came in. Oh. They kind of led the think they led you all that way to kind of that's absolutely impossible we went in a straight line almost vertical up the hill top of the hill is only about 50 feet across then down the other side of the hill then how do you come out where you went in in the same place exactly <laughs> right you know and, and it is it, that sounds like folks were sitting here telling you stories but we're not it's just things you only experience by getting out in the woods you don't get to watch this on some of these these TV shows that you got going through, the things that you experience as a researcher in the woods, there's no substitute for because there's things going to happen to you or you're going to see that is going to be so interesting. It's going to change the way you look at Bigfoot. It's going to change the way you look at a lot of things, you know. And and so uh, when we have that right there, me and Stephen, and then too, sometimes I think maybe their behavior like that may be actually uh, species oriented. The ones that we have down here in Fout, they tend to have a real bad attitude. And I think that maybe because everything, whether it's alligators, snakes, wolves, bobcats, yeah. bears, whatever it is that, that they're going to try to have as food, it's going to try to have them back. But then you go up there to the area we have called Ground Zero, which is up there in the foothills of the Washita Mountains, and they tend to be just as laid back as they can be. You yeah, know, well, like the ones up here, really mellow. Yeah, really mellow. You know, and they they whistled at us for three days. <laughs> you know, kept us on the on the uneasy you know a lot of that but still they whistled us for three days but just letting us know hey we're here you know I'm i think, like, I think a lot of it has to do with the troop or tribe yeah that they belong exactly. to because it they kind of reflect whatever the alpha male wants right and if he wants nothing to do with humans they're going to take advantage of that to scare you and chase you out yep. and if he's kind of indifferent then it's you know <laughs> case by case hey what are these humans doing? Let's follow them around. We don't have rules from the Alpha that we have to chase right. them away or avoid them. You know, That's we right. go spy on them and have fun. You know, and, and they do. That's why you see, <clears throat> again, I spoke of classic Bigfoot behavior, and you've heard it by other people. But as far as them leaning out behind a tree and watching you, man, yeah. that's just as real as, as what you've seen on, the, what you've heard it is and what you've actually seen on TV. They are sit there. They're wonderful at spying on you like that right there. <laughs> it's kind of their job, and they're really good at it. You know, one of my favorite pictures we ever got, Erin took a picture across the river. She's standing on one river bank, river drops way down, comes up again. There's the other <coughs> river bank. She's pretty much eye level with it because the bank she's standing on is lower. Right. So where she's focusing the camera is right at ground level. So there's about a foot and a half of grass. There's three conical heads sticking up out of the grass looking at her. <laughs> exactly. You know, and and uh, I see you get down here in the south. I don't know whether it's inbreeding or what it is. Not everyone's going to have that conical head down here. Like I said, we've got some what we call them Hanks. But if you take a look at the Freeman video and how that one's walking through and he's got his head leaning forward and looking like yeah. that turns and looks at Freeman, they tend to have those rounder heads. We've got some of those that are down here. When I first started Bigfoot researching and I saw the one that I saw in 1977, I thought, oh, yeah, man, this right here, they're all got cone heads. Yeah. I had a food awakening whenever I started finding, seeing some. I actually watched one one day pop up out of a brush top, just lean up like that right there. You've got a round head is what you know what you and I have, you know. Yeah. They've, got, they've got the same little brow ridge right there. I'm like, oh, my gosh. We got, just... we got both up here, and I think uh... – 
that's kind of again a um, regional thing. Yep. Like most of the ones you guys have down there tend to be round headed. Right. A lot of the ones that we have up here in the Pac West tend to be cone headed. Right. But not all of them. Right. I think the true Southern Sasquatch we have in here, I think they're probably the ones that are cone headed. Whether it's the round ones, the round headed ones, you know, whether it's inbreeding or whether it's just another species, but we do tend to have the round headed ones down here. And uh, one of my friends, whenever I was telling him about what I'd seen, and he saw one here about. Uh, a man named Randy Richmond. Randy Bullock, so he's just, man, he's just trustworthy with anything he tells you. And he said, well, wait, he said, you know, mine didn't have a cone head. I said, really? He goes, no, mine had a round head, you know, first yeah. one he'd ever seen. And so, well, sure. Glag, I, look at, you know, look at how much time that Kevin spent with Glag. Glag had a round head. He didn't have a sagittal crest. And you could always say, well, it's because he, he was younger. He was yeah. an adult yet. But then again, that sagittal crest thing doesn't seem to have anything to do with being an adult male like a gorilla thing. Because right. even Patty had kind of a sagittal crest. And that's a female, right. you know. Yeah. You know, when you look at that picture that I, that I sent to you a couple of years ago where me and Stephen have the one of the mama and has that baby on her shoulder and she's walking by. You can see that baby's kind of got kind of a little starting. <laughs> but you look yeah. at mama and she's got that round head there to her. So, again, it's with her species. Uh, it's it's just amazing that, uh, that, that, that they're as diverse as what they are, but still exhibit some of the same characteristics. They still exhibit the same smartness. They're better in their environment than what we are in our environment. Certainly better than what we are in their environment. Maybe not always in our environment, but they're ever a bit as good and situated to live and and be uh, and take care of themselves in their environment. It's what we are here, but they're certainly better in their environment than what we are. They can hide, man. They can hide in plain sight. I've had them sit there and stand just perfectly still, and you're thinking that you know it's it's just a shadow. Then all of a sudden you walk a little further, then you hear him taking off the other way. <laughs> or uh, have one friend or the there. The shadow starts going like this. Yeah, yeah. They start to sway, man. The swaying scares you to death, you know, because you're like you're not he's going thousand one, thousand two, thousand. <laughs> <laughs> he's working up the something. Drunk, you know? This might be a good time to back up. Yeah, exactly right. He's okay. I'm already up to five. You better get going. But I had another lady there named Mindy that worked at Bass Pro Shops, young lady from Oklahoma. <laughs> and she was arguing with her boyfriend one night and she was driving. And so she pulled up to a stop sign and she was just letting him have it. And one of the little salt cedar trees there on the side of the road that she's sitting there parked by all of a sudden that salt cedar tree stands up, starts walking towards their truck. And she's oh. like, oh, my gosh, I better get the heck out of here. That that fight was over with. Boyfriend realized he better straighten up. She took off driving. And from what I hear, everything's hunky dory after all that. You know, something like that. So really, really, uh, you know, it sounds like a story, but it's not. You know, this uh, some of the things these people uh, that they that they experience. Uh, oh gosh, that's, that's one reason I wrote my book. I didn't. I wanted folks to know some of the things they have done, and I'm actually in the process of writing another book right now, book two there, uh, based on a lot of what mine and Stephen's experiences are. My first book doesn't have as very very few in there, but some of the things that we've experienced, man, we've had, you know, we've had uh, oh, a ball one night when Stephen came out there, and I was in church, and he called and he said, "Man, where are you?" And I said, "Well, I'm just stepping out of church." He goes, "No, up here at Ground Zero." I said, "I'm stepping out of church," and uh, he goes, are you serious? I said, yeah. He goes, I just heard your hoot out call. I said, you didn't hear my hoot out call, you know, our bar out. Uh, and so he said, I swear I did. So anyway, he had just coughed. And so then he comes back a couple of days later when he tries that same thing again. This time the coughing is on Stephen. He's out of there in about probably about five minutes. This thing was not playing the same game it played from the first night. So, and he said it was actually white and it scared him to death, you know, and so sure enough, well, we get a, a picture there a little bit later on that year of one that's standing in the woods, and he's actually got a white tent to his face in his fur. So, again, really, really interesting things that, that happen to you. And, and, again, so blessed to have researchers, you know, like Stephen, that are, are my research partners that uh, that uh, I trust infinitely. Basically, you do trust them with your life because that's exactly what it what it is. They're there, the things you're sharing. You count on them to, uh, to look out for you as well and uh, to not do something stupid that's going to endanger your life. And uh, we've been very blessed to have Stephen as a researcher. You know, we even had a dog man walking up the hill there, leading three Bigfoot out of the woods, and the dog man's in the lead. I didn't understand that. Still don't. What the hell? Yeah, exactly. But the dog man is in the lead, and Stephen will tell you. And then 
when we get to, he gets to taking peripheral pictures when he does, you look and they're going down the edge of the pine plantation right there. There's a mama and she's kind of pushing along a little young juvenile there in front of her. Like I'm fixing to get away from this dog man unless there's, you know, something going to happen. I have no idea, but uh, like I said, trust in my life with Steven. And I was looking at my, uh, my SD cards trying to get them lined up and Steven goes, stop. And I said, what am I doing? He goes, no, stop. I stop and look and here comes that dog man walking up out of the bottom of the bottoms right there. We're leading three Bigfoot and that Bigfoot just kind of squat down there in the grass and you can't see him but dog man don't squat down dog man just stands right there and looks at him, but, he, but he don't try to charge us you know and then you see there's another little baby dog man that goes there and there's a log that's leaning like this and the baby dog man gets underneath the log like that and just kind of hides and I've got pictures of him standing there hiding there like that right there so so again like I said you basically trust your life with your research partners but the things you know that, that we you know Great guys and enjoy having a good time together and seeing these things and and uh, our wives think we're the worst Bigfoot hunters in the world. You know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you got to send your uh, baby dog man hiding pictures so that I can include those now that you told everybody about it. <laughs> yeah, and the other new picture that you sent that was really good is the one in broad daylight standing in yeah. a bush. How the hell did you get that picture, man? Just 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 uh, you know. Anybody that thinks they don't know where your cameras are, they're wrong. You know, last year I sent you pictures that one baby at nighttime staring there in big old bright eyes, but just yeah. happened to have it in the right place. And I found I found a couple of tree breaks through there that hadn't been there before. And I realized he was using, you know, using that area to walk back through there. And it's real close to the same area. So I was able to sit there and I just put another camera there. And again, we hide our cameras. Uh, I don't normally time the trees. We hide them in brush tops. And so this camera was hidden in a brush top and it happens to, to walk by, of course, and it makes that little, you know, little shutter makes a little clicking noise. And then he looks and, and again, I've told y'all, sometimes they take your camera and they throw them about a hundred yards after that. But I was lucky he was able to find this one. And, or they uh, try and eat over, they smash it to a bunch of cheese. <laughs> exactly. If, if y'all remember our show from last year or two years ago, when the one crushed mine and Steven's camera, uh, every piece of glass on there is broken. There's more scratches on it from Bigfoot teeth. And uh, and then the two, the one I've got the picture of, and the Bigfoot actually is trying to cram it into his mouth, and his nose is twisted like that, and he's got that mouth wide open. You're looking right down at the goozle right there. And I had known that he was My picking My favorite picture is a picture from inside of his mouth looking out, where yeah, he was trying to eat the game cam, and it took a picture out of his mouth. It did do that. <laughs> and then we also have one inside a dog man's mouth there that's the same way, taking a picture outside that dog man's mouth. So, so uh, you know, they, uh, they're they a strange creature. Uh, but, but Bigfoot is also one thing I have learned, another classic behavior. Bigfoot are oral animals. They love to bite whatever you've got. They're going to put their teeth on it just like – you know, like a dog will or like babies will, they're going to put it in their mouth. They're going to taste it and sample it. I've had them do that with uh, sardine cans. I've had them do it with uh, marbles. I've had them do it uh, with some of the Legos that we put up there. Uh, we hit, left a baseball bat to gift to it one time down here at Sulphur River. And so we went back and I couldn't find it. Finally, I found it and it was about 40 yards away. This time it was turned upside down, but still leaning against the tree. But it had like five or six big bites where he just taken it. Almost like an ear of corn. I th and I carried that to Nebraska. I think I showed you know, in Nebraska. And you can see where the, in the the big front teeth right here just kind of peeled down it. Well, they say the the uh, lacquer that's on these bats tastes like you know ants, something from an ant bed. Evidently, he thought he had him a daggum big daggum ant popsicle or something or other. But he bit the thing, and so they are. They tend to uh, to bite. And uh, I've had them bite some of the tree structures that you find. I mean, there's a, a, a tooth brand. I showed one to a guy. He's an amateur uh anthropologist down here but he's also a biology teacher and i showed it to him and we have one and we put a potato out there well the bigfoot they also recognize what's yours is, is is yours and what's theirs is theirs we had a potato that we had taken we had put it underneath another tree there and it had fallen out this thing had bit this potato and actually had the teeth prints in there and then it had brought it back and put it there right underneath where we had our camera and so i showed it to this anthropologist and he goes that's that's no creature that we have around here. I said, oh, yes, it is. 
And he said, Jeff is <laughs> the one you don't know about. <laughs> yeah, that's what we said. He said it's not it's not one you know this document around here. And it just blew his mind. And now he's uh I can call him with anything that I have that, that I don't understand. And he'll uh because he's a very, very, very smart man. And uh and then just kind of changed his way of looking at the way things are done, that these some of the things that we have here in these woods, some of the things they can do. So really, really interesting. And and again, like I said, what's theirs is theirs. Don't get something of theirs because they're gonna chase you down for it most of the time. But then what's yours like i said they'll bring to you and they'll put it there uh, I, I talked to uh, a man here the, well, last night there with text law research and they found some rocks up there some rocks uh, stacking and they were one of the head he had some of the, his other researchers they had a dismantling to look at it got down to the bottom of this stack of rocks and there was a walkie-talkie and so it was just brand spanking new they had bought it the day before well, the guy had lost it He's got the walkie-talkie there. He walks into camp, holds it up by the antenna like this, and the guy goes, oh, my gosh. And he said, what? He said, that's the walkie-talkie I lost yesterday. He said, where did you find it? It was about almost a mile away, and they had stacked it. Under a pile of rocks. <laughs> Under a pile of rocks, exactly right. You know? And then another man that they told me about had had a picture, and he'd stuck it in his a pocket, and it was a picture of his, his grandkids going to something like Six Flags or something like that. He stuck it in his pocket where well, it had fallen out, and he wasn't looking for it, couldn't find it. They go, and they look in another another one of these rock clad, rock stacks, and when it is, sure enough, there's this picture. He brings it up there and hands it to him. He said, does this look familiar? He goes, oh, man, that's the picture I lost you. Where'd you find it? It was at the bottom of a stack of rocks, hidden underneath a stack of rocks. So, you know. Uh, do I doubt it? No, I don't doubt okay, it. Okay, that's all. a new one on me. Yeah, <laughs> returning me. stuff to the humans, just bury it under a pile of rocks. Uh, yeah, You'll find exactly it. Exactly right. <laughs> you know? And uh, oh gosh, man, they do. This one guy up here, he uh, that I know, he he takes out golf balls out there, colored golf balls, and uh, he would see how smart they were. He would hide the the different colored golf balls, and uh, they would go find all the red ones, and they would bring it back, and they would put it to his tree where he had his camera set up and set them all underneath there. And the rest of them, they would leave alone. They wanted to have nothing to do with it, but they wanted those red golf balls all in the same place. So I said, it sounds nuts, but but it's not. You know, me and Steven's the one we had on the gifting stump. That little junk, we had a little baby that would play with Legos. He would play with marbles. We'd leave him a Snickers bar so he could do that. And when he'd get through, he would take the green marbles and just get them totally off the stump. He did not want those green marbles nowhere on that stump like that. And then he would rearrange the rocks and stuff. Really, really interesting. And and uh, I wasn't one who really believed in the gifting stuff at first, but my preacher's son left one of his little Debbie snack cakes there quite by accident. He goes, man, I left my snack cake. The next time you get up there, do you bring it back? I said, sure. Wherever to find it, the snack cake was gone, but there were the rocks on the gifting stump. My buddy Randy Crawford said, did you leave these rocks up here? I said, no. I said, they should have been right there where Tyron was sitting with that little Derby snack cake. So anyway, Randy took and rearranged them. Sure enough, we come back there and we take a picture of where they are, come back the next time and they're totally rearranged. So then we started, me and Steven started bringing the marble, the Legos and little kitty cat balls that have the, the bells in them inside. Like yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And uh, the, man, they're just fascinated with him. We've got a picture of this little baby over there in front of this gifting stump, and he's leaning over and he's playing. It's from the back, but he's playing with these uh, marbles and these Legos right there. And you see playing his duck. You recognize the shape. That's what he's doing over there. Now I've got a picture to compare. I've got a picture of a big one that's there where we call the candy store, where we would leave our candy bars with the logs like that. And sure enough, you see this big one up there, and he's leaned over in exactly the same position as what this baby is there in that gifting stump. So again, classic. Bigfoot behavior, uh, yes, it has to, it has to be. For for me, I'm satisfied that it is, even though I've only seen it on those two cases right there. It's just two. But yeah, I was just kind of blown away by that one you got in the bush there because I was like, wait, this is a how the hell did you get him to go in front of a game cam during the day? You know, and, and, and that's a picture of. And I think I had it he had good enough, and I think he I think his own curiosity just got the best of him enough. You know, that he's like, I've got to see this, you know, and he didn't hang around after that, you know, because that was the I only. I wonder if he just wasn't 100 percent sure it was there. Well, you know, and and, and that's true uh, because uh, I, the way I do hide him, you know, well, like I said, we don't tie him on the, the edge of trees and stuff because, man, we have one. Oh, me and Jim, the one who's been going with me since Stephen had been able to go. And we have one the other day just take it just and just snap the strap that straps it to a tree. Just yeah. I mean, busted it. 
And uh, so, uh, but I think I had it good enough hit in that doggone, uh, in that brush right there that, that he thought it was there, but he wasn't sure. And then by the time that he was sure it was too late, you know. Just, <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, damn it, there is one in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and but the man they do, they know where our cameras are. And like I said, especially these little babies, man, they, uh, uh, it's, it's just amazing how they uh, they do that right there. And, and they'll sit there and they know, and they'll fool around, get their picture took. And they, the next response is either a hand reaching in there to get your dog on camera, or else you got a face with eyeballs sitting there looking there. Then they're going to get your camera <laughs> and give yeah. it a good. But really, really interesting. And I, I think that's because of the personal relationship that, because I've never shot at them, I've never aimed a gun at them. And, you know, so I tend to bring them, you know, apples or something to eat or something like that, or tend to respect their territory. You know, I'm not down there just just going bananas, uh, trying to be respectful of the area that they live in. And uh, same way, I wouldn't want somebody coming to my house and, you know, tearing up Jack and all that stuff like that. I, I don't leave it all junky. I don't tear all the trees down. I don't push all the trees down, seeing how, trying to see how strong. But we actually have some respect for their areas. And I think they maybe truly, maybe they appreciate that. I really do. Uh, they realize that we're respectful of them and, and, you know, especially don't mess with the little ones. We see a lot of little ones. We get a lot of pictures of babies. And you know, we don't mess with them. So I think maybe that's because we are just because of the respect that we tend to show their ears. And another reason he didn't just throw that camera, you know, mile and a half over there after he got his picture. But that's a good picture, though. I thought it was a good picture. I was Yeah, wrong. that is a good one. And again, uh, that falls right in line with what the native tribes will all tell you too. You know, they're they're a kind of people and you have to respect them, show them respect. And if you do that, probably everything will be okay. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 100% guaranteed, but <laughs> a lot better chance you're not going to get a tree whacking you like a fly swatter. So yeah. the only time definitely comes in front of prop is, is the, the probably is when it's in in the daggum alphabet. Other than that, right there, you better be aware of that probably because that probably is a big deal right there for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only thing that I could say, you know, uh, the. The regular Bigfoot will usually give you some kind of a warning if there's going to be an issue and they'll try and get you to leave. Some of these other cryptids, total crapshoot. They could just decide to out of the blue they're going to jump your ass and kill you. So you have to keep awareness of what's going on around you at all times when you're out in the woods. We take, take for example the Gugway picture. Yeah. And that dude right there, he's running across the field on all fours. At first, I think he's a hog because he's big and black. And then I look and see and see the body shape. I'm like, that's a Bigfoot. And he slows down. He's sitting there watching me go through there. So I run over to catch him as he goes to brush. And I've already got my camera out and everything. And I'm fixing to go. And all of a sudden, I walk up. And there he is. And there's that log. And he's got these these uh, roots there. And he's got that head stuck in his roots just like that, just being still. All of a sudden, I see him turn his head and look back towards him like he's got another hunting partner with him. Uh-huh. I got my three pictures out of there. And I got the heck out of Dodge. Because it was not, like I said, he gave me it uh, on that deal right there by his aggressiveness. I truly think at first I thought he was just running through the woods. But after I had uh, looked at those situations, I think he actually was running towards me to set me up after that. And so I do yeah, say he was he, trying that, to lure you further into the woods. Exactly right. And and that's what they did. Like I said, they let you know that something wasn't going to go good. And thank goodness, you know, the light came on. It flickered at first. But when it finally came on, it <laughs> took me long to... <laughs> It didn't take me long to get back. The to light bulb. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hey, that's a gugly. Time to leave. <laughs> and all I had was a, a, a forty caliber Glock. And so my friend Randy Crawford, uh, that's one of my big foot researchers, very very smart man, good researcher. And he said, "Man, we got to go back out there tomorrow." Because I, I sent it to him. He's got two monitors on his desk. He's got them side by side. He goes, "You've got something there." I said, "Oh, I know, I've got something there." I watched him. You know, watch him on all fours. I couldn't go back because of post-traumatic stress. I told him, I said, I can't make it. Finally, the afternoon, didn't know what my son had ordered me a 4570 rifle. Then yeah. that's what they, the, you know, what they used to buffalo hunt with. And I figured yeah. this, if this thing will shoot lengthwise the grizzly bear, it'll shoot the gug away. So I took that 4570 back out there, and then things were a little bit more on even kill. Do I want to kill even? A, a gug away will kill you in a heart. <coughs> And that's and that's a fact. And I believe that's the Sasquatch. Do they get along with the Gugwee? No. Oh, they, exactly. they have wars with them. They kill them. The dogmen get along with them? No. They have wars with them. They kill them. That's okay, it. Sasquatch guys, when you're fighting a Gugwee, how do you kill them? Well, we t- twist their heads off. <laughs> okay, well, a um, uh, human here can't twist Gugwee's head off. Nope. What do you recommend we do? Here's our advice: shoot him in the eye. That, yeah, exactly. And then not with a 40 caliber Glock either with like that. <laughs> no. 
I shoot them in the eye with something that's going to blow the back of their head off and go through the next three trees behind it. Yeah, as, as the cliche goes, I'm going to open up his mind for, for <laughs> yeah. all the way through the backside. Because yeah, exactly. But that was really scary with me because I'd never experienced that kind of aggression with one running, uh, even a Bigfoot running up that far on me that fast right there. And when I finally figured it out, I said, I saw him turn that head and look back over his shoulder like he had a, a hunting partner. Man, it got serious. And uh, and and that's when I realized I better get out of there. And I took off running up that hill. I just left Keith Crabtree spring camp out there. And whenever that had happened, I had found the one structure there, the Bigfoot had built, the big, nice looking. Yeah. And that's that. what attracted you. You were just driving along and saw something on the side of the road and went, hey, that's a structure. I'm going to go check it. it out. When you get out there, here comes this one running along trying to get your attention. Yep. Sounds like a setup to me. It did sound like this. And that's what I figured. It's, it, it, I'm not just exaggerating, folks. I'm telling you, that's what happened. He knew that that was, uh, I don't know if he knew it was going to be me or not, but he knew that that might be an attention getter. And so there he comes. And so he's running across there, man, like a buffalo when he comes up there. And again, I thought it was hogs. We got some hogs here, man, five and 600 pounds easily. And uh, but when he's on all fours and buffalo, over, we've had a couple of my old girlies killed. We've had two that were over 600 pounds that were killed. I mean, they look like little black Volkswagens over there, but the way this thing was. And you can see just again, he's got four feet wide shoulders. Uh, he's got that nose right there, that that dog style nose up there. And you can just see just how uh, how sinister. And as stupid as that sounds, a sinister look on his face, like, I mean you harm. And thank goodness I was able to uh, pick up on that. And I and I got out of Dodge after that. I was glad I did. It, it took two days before I finally got over it and Randy and I went back, took about 50 pictures to compare with. And sure enough, and you know what was there was not there. And remember, I gave you advice, too. Heavily yep. armed, heavily armed, heavily armed. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and I said, I no, don't care. No little pop guns, big one. <laughs> exactly. And uh I don't carry the guns that I carry. Bigfoot has actually seen me carrying the gun last year when Daniel and I were down there at Ground Zero. We went through there and Daniel's taking pictures and we've got some babies over here and Robin's actually on the phone with Daniel and we've got some babies over here that are making the chatter, the samurai chatter, but we're getting some limbs that are being snapped too. Daniel had been treated by some hogs that morning, so he was exceptionally <laughs> Exceptionally, Poor Daniel. yeah, he was he was especially not not at ease. Let's just put it that way. And so I said, man, just take some pictures. We'll we'll you know see, get rid in case we see some over there. So Daniel's just taking pictures. He takes one of me. I'm right there in front. I've got the 4570 rifle. I'm looking towards all these Bigfoot over here, the baby Bigfoot making noise. When we go back and look at this picture, there's one that's 35 yards in front of me. They're hiding behind the tree, just peeking out. Never saw him, missed him because I was so concerned about this one over here. But I, I've sent you the picture. You know, I mean, he's there. there. There's no doubt, you know, about it. He's sitting right there looking at us. And then about probably five minutes after that, we had, I think it was probably Mama, just let us just flash us, just like don't be stupid you know take this as a warning and so damn mm -hmm. like, what are we gonna do <laughs> we're gonna see what she's gonna do first <laughs> but uh, everything worked out good didn't have any more howls from her or growls or whatever you want to call those right there and then uh, daniel actually took uh, some pictures there and he actually got some pictures some babies right there in those uh in that those brush over there just to the side that we were looking at so really really interesting thing too like i said they had ways to let me know though that there was a uh, yeah things and then they took a rock a giant rock as we were leaving while we were there in the woods and picked it up out of the road bed now they didn't dig it up they ripped it up and they turned it up to where if I would have gone the same way, I would end up knocking the oil pan off my daggum truck. And I'm like, Daniel, that was not there when we came down here. He goes, no, it wasn't down there. They had left us a, you know, left us a message. Hey, this is our territory. You know, uh, you know, we're still in charge, even though we're allowing you to be here. So that was real cool. And I've got pictures of that rock. That rock is huge, man. It's just twice as big as a bowling ball, you know. So, so. Oh, uh, God. Oh, yeah. You know, and. Yeah, you could like drive over that, not notice oh, it on the way in. There's no way in hell. Exactly. You know, good old Daniel, he's a good luck charm. He's been down here three times and he's been able to get three different pictures, you know. And so of the creatures, he got that one there on the drone that you yeah. see there that's walk. And then uh, he got the one that he and I got that's 10 and a half foot tall. And uh, when we're just, he's just taking the random pictures. He's got a really great phone. Mine's pretty sucky as far as that goes. But he, got, <laughs> he got the, even bought a new one and it ain't worth a nickel. Yep. It's called. Searching for the unfindable and you can get it on Amazon. Yep. And here it is right here. Like I said, it's all 
400 and I think 49 pages, including 47 years or 46 years of my research that I've been doing. And I didn't break it off. I kept it because I didn't want to just leave everything in the middle right there. So it's all continuous. I said, I've got color pictures in there, color pictures of actual Bigfoot, you know. And yeah. so, uh, again, uh, I appreciate everybody who has bought it and listened to it. But it, it's, a, it's a labor of love. But I share everything. I don't hold anything back that, that's happened to me. And, uh, again, I hope that's something that helps you to have a Bigfoot sighting and maybe you'll broaden your, your uh, knowledge in, in a Bigfoot. So, again, thanks to Duke and, you know, Rob and, and uh, the Boo Girls there who have helped to uh, promote my book there. And if you get a chance, that you can find it, you know, on Amazon or on, on uh, you can find it on, there's another deal called Lulu. They have the. Uh, yeah, Lulu's print on demand. You can go there yep. and get it too. Yep. And I recommend that you get it because I got a copy of it. And it was so good. It was so good that when I did my one and only episode of Summit Camp Duke, <laughs> where I sat at the top of a mountain summit in my camp chair and read Bigfoot stories, I read a story out of William's book. Hey, that I tells you how great it is. I appreciate that too, man. Like I said, y'all been great to help me. And, and again, uh, like I said, it, it's all true. That's the thing that you know. This ain't something that's been made up or been told me by a 30 second cousin of a friend you know who had a <laughs> and stuff. this is stuff that's happened to me man that's why i've got all this gray in my chin and in my hair from more, all these things that have actually just run me yeah, william's only 30 look at the beating he's <laughs> taken in order to get out there and get all that evidence for you yep, guys that's it but, but uh, again if you get a chance to do it please do thanks to the ones who have thank you duke for having me again thank you for our responders and our service people and veterans means the world to me. So uh, thank y'all. I'll see y'all next time. Hopefully it won't be as long. All right. Same thing for me too. All you first responders out there and military that protect our butts all the time. And hopefully we can get you stationed down on the border here shortly. Yep. Our border <laughs> where you're needed. Uh, get we things, love you. And, get and things out. love everybody else out there too. Thanks for taking the time to watch the show. I always really appreciate it. Got a bunch of good stuff coming up. And don't forget, Nebraska Bigfoot Conference, world premiere of inevitably finding Bigfoot. You're going to love that. Coming up on the 26th <laughs> and the 27th. Don't be a loser. Come on over and see it. Be the first <laughs> person to see it. And by the way, T-shirts and mugs are available. There you go. As a matter of fact, da -da, da -da 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 -da, inevitably finding Bigfoot mug. I have one. It's true. They exist. <laughs> That's what the uptown Bigfooters are drinking their cappuccinos from. Right That's right. Here. You know how we find home. Bigfoot? We drink our morning coffee at camp <laughs> to inevitably finding Bigfoot mug. There you go. We're sure you're going to find one that day. It's inevitable. That's it. Ask, ask Elon. He likes that. There one. you go. <laughs> and what's that ZZ Top song we used to say? I heard it on the X. Ask Elon. That's now That's called right. the X. I heard it on the X and heard it from Duke. <laughs> We heard it on the X. <laughs> All right, everybody. And speaking of the X, I am over there. So come on over and uh, friend me over there on X. I always post updates for everything that's going on. Kelly Shaw's over there posting hilarious Bigfoot memes all the time. And both of us post links for anything that we're turning out, so you'll always be able to find it there. If some other platforms don't bother to notify you, and don't hug the Ohio grass. <laughs> when the moon hangs high on the breast of the lake, in the bite of the wind, it's like a slap in the face. A legend of horror lurks in the haze. It's Bigfoot. A giant of a creature, all covered with hair. As tall as a timber and strong as a bear. Y'all better not go walking out there with Bigfoot.
from the tales of the traitors and trappers to the image on Indian walls, from the bare paw mountains of Montana to the sands of the great Shastas, from the flatheads to Blackfeet and the Shoshones, he must have seen them all. And when the sun goes down in the northwest woods, if you listen, you can hear him call. Big foot's coming, gonna get you, gonna get you, gonna get you. foot's coming, so you better watch out. Lock your doors and bolt your windows. Just bolt your windows. Mm -hmm.